please join me in our call to worship as printed in your bulletins. We worship the God who inhabits our world and indwells our lives. We need not look up to find God. We, we need only look around, look around within, within ourselves, ourselves beyond, beyond ourselves, ourselves into, into the eyes of another. We need not listen for a distant thunder to find God. We need only listen to the music of life, the words of children, the questions of the curious, the rhythm of the heartbeat. We worship the God who inhabits our world and who indwells our lives. We come to worship, to hear God's word, to gather our hearts, and to be equipped to love and serve alongside you, a living, calling, good news God. We come, we come to, worship to worship you. you. Amen. Friends, let us pray. We turn to you often, O God, as we seek through prayer to find the meaning of life. Sometimes it's a fervent prayer in the midst of serious meditation, but more often it's a fleeting prayer on the run. We pray for patience when there are too many things to be done. We pray that you will awaken us to hear the cries of the poor, the homeless, the brokenhearted. Help us to redirect more of our resources to clothe the naked and feed the hungry. Mold us, O oh God, and open our hearts and minds to be willing vessels of your spirit. In your word, we know how a scribe said to you, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And you bluntly responded, following me isn't easy. We want to follow you, Jesus. But we, like your disciples, struggle with doubt and fear. Our doubt and fear take over, often clouding our understanding of your miraculous love. You ask them, why are you afraid, you of little faith? You ask us the same thing today. We confess our fear of the unknown. We confess our need to be in control. We confess our inability to trust you completely. Forgive us, encourage us, teach us to follow even when we don't think we can anymore. 
even though faith often is not easy, replace our doubts with faithfulness, our fears with courage, and our apathy with love. We have taken time to admit some things that we want or need to change, a mistake, some guilt, a lie, the brokenness of it all. Something somehow has made us feel distant from you. But in Jesus Christ, we can be assured we are not distant. We have been heard. We are loved and we are forgiven. Knowing we are forgiven, we are bold to bring our prayers to you. May we embody you, O Christ, in all we do. We pray all of these things, confident of your love, grateful for your faithfulness, and in awe of all you've done, as we pray the prayer you taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Hi, I'm Laura. I'm an assistant youth leader, and I'm young at heart. Hi, I'm Abby, and I'm 14 years old. What's up? I'm Greg. I'm 17 years old. I'm Tiernan, and I'm 17 years old. I'm Josie, and I'm 13 years old. I'm Erica, and I'm 15 years old. I'm Christopher, and I'm 17 years old. Hi, I'm Doug, and I am an honorary teenager. Hi, I'm Haley, and I'm 18 years old. Hello, I'm Paige, and I'm also 18. Hi, I'm Katie. I am the youth leader here. And we are Hopewell Presbyterian Church's youth group. The verse we want to talk to you all about today is Micah 6, 8. And here's how that goes. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. We like this Bible verse because the Lord doesn't require us to be perfect. He only requires that we are just, merciful, and humble. Uh, what we like about this verse is that uh, the verse talks about like ways of action and ways of life and not basing it on anyone's physical appearance or anything like that. And it also tells us how we're perfectly imperfect and God just wants us to keep trying. I really love this verse. Um, it is short, it is easy to remember, and it is crystal clear on how I should respond. That's one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. And we found a story that we think serves as a really great example of how we can live out that verse. And it's a story from history. This is a book that my parents used to read to me when I was younger, and it's called The Children's Book of Home and Family. And inside of it is a story called Jane Addams and Whole House. And the description is pretty great. It says, here is the story of a woman who showed the world what it means to be a good neighbor. So we hope this story inspires you all to think of ways that you can live out Micah 6-8 in your own lives. So I hope you enjoy this story and illustrations by one of our very own students, Abby Blakeart. Let's listen. Jane Adams was six years old when she set out with her father one day on an errand. They passed through a poor part of town where the streets were shabby and all the houses looked sad. Why do people live in such horrid little houses built so close together? Jane asked. They don't want to live here, her father explained. But these people are very poor. Most of them never went to school. They don't have a chance to move to nicer homes. Jane thought about that for a minute and made up her mind. When I grow up, I'm going to have a great big house, she said. But it's not going to be on a nice street with other big houses. It's going to be right in the middle of horrid little houses like these. And the children who don't have a chance to play at home can come and play in my yard. You might not expect a person to stick to a promise like that, especially if she made it when she was only six years old. 
But Jane's father had taught her that we are put on this earth to help each other, and she never forgot her promise. When Jane grew up, she went to the great city of Chicago and looked in the poorest part of the town, where the buildings were dirty, the sidewalks were broken, and the cobblestones in the street were worn away. The air smelled of all the trash lying around. Many of the houses had no running water. In the middle of this dingy neighborhood, Jane found an old brick mansion with a wide, friendly porch. As soon as she saw it, she knew it would be her home. Many years before, a man named Charles Hull had built it, so the name of the place was Hull House. Jane began cleaning up the old place and turning it into her home. She scrubbed the floors and hung pictures on the walls. Her friends were horrified. They warned her not to move into such a dirty, run-down neighborhood. But Jane knew it was a place where she could do much good, and it wasn't long before some of her friends came to join her. The people of the neighborhood did not know what to make of these clean, well-dressed young ladies who had moved into the whole house. What did they want? Why in the world had they come here when they could have lived someplace much nicer? At first, the neighbors kept their distance, but soon they noticed the warm smiles of the ladies sitting on the big, friendly porch. They began coming up the steps to say hello. Before long, Jane and the ladies of Hull House were making friends. Every day as she sat on her porch, Jane saw little girls and boys running in the crowded streets. Their mothers and fathers worked all day long, and the children had no place to go. Jane knew they needed a good friend, so she told their parents she would look after them. Before long, Hull House was full of the sounds of babies laughing and children playing in the halls. Jane knew that boys and girls liked to be outdoors, and it made her sad to think that the only place these children had was the streets. So she got a man who owned some old buildings to knock them down and build a playground in their place. She had promised her father many years before that children would come and play in her yard, and now her promise was coming true. One evening, Jane and her friends gave a party for their neighbors at Hull House, and they had candy for all the children. But when the candy dish came around to one group of girls, they sadly shook their heads and said, no thank you. They worked all day long in a candy factory, they said, and could not stand the sight of anything sweet. In those days, you see, children of poor families often worked in hot, dusty factories from seven o'clock in the morning until nine at night. It broke Jane's heart to think of boys and girls bending over loud, noisy machines. So she went straight to the governor and helped make a law to keep little children out of the factories. That was Jane's way. Whenever she saw a neighbor in need, she tried to help. The doors of Hull House were never locked. It was a place for people to come together and share a meal, listen to music, and swap stories. Jane and her friends started a library so that poor families could have books to read. They held art classes for children and their parents. They visited the sick and helped people find jobs. Even when she grew old, Jane still lived at Hull House. Anyone who came to her doorstep could always find welcoming arms. Until the day she died, Jane was a good friend to the people who needed her most. All her neighbors loved her, and she became one of the most admired people in the whole country. Jane Addams had made a promise to her father, and she kept it. She turned a great big house into a home that made the world a better place to live. Good morning to you. Our scripture lesson is taken this morning from 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verses 16 through 18. And they read thus. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let us pray. Come now, O Lord, in power and in might. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. It is often uh, the case that the best title for a sermon comes to us straight out of the biblical text. <clears throat> And such is the case this morning with my title for this sermon. In all things, give thanks. These words come to us from the great Apostle Paul. Some would say they come from the greatest preacher 
this side of Jesus Christ. But he encourages us this morning by saying to us, in all things, in everything, <clears throat> give thanks. This great apostle was credited with eventually bringing the gospel to Europe. His greatness stems from the fact that he took the gospel far and wide, which included places like Thessalonica. Thessalonica was a great city, rebuilt by Cassander and renamed after his wife, the daughter of Philip of Macedon and half-sister of Alexander the Great. It is impossible to overstate the importance of the arrival of Christianity to this great city. For when Christianity was settled there, it spread east until all of Asia was conquered and west until it stormed the city of Rome. One writer said that the coming of Christianity to Thessalonica was crucial in the making of it into a world religion. Paul endured much suffering and duress in his efforts to bring the gospel to Thessalonica. I marvel at how often in our day, whenever we encounter opposition in our work for Christ, we began to question our call and God's claim on our lives. In 25 years of teaching at Princeton Seminary, I have seen any number of students come to the school with great hope and promise for Christian ministry. But some do not last a year before they become disillusioned with the instruction and formation that the seminary offers. They see the foundational work that we do in seminary as not being worthy of their time, or in the case of some, actually slowing them down from the real work of Christian ministry. So they drop out. Others leave at the first challenge to long-held beliefs. Opposition to their beliefs is so discouraging to some that they decide that the seminary is just not for them. Not so with Paul. He did not allow himself to be deterred by opposition to his beliefs or disappointment with those who claim to be adherents to the faith. In the face of stiff opposition, even to the point of threatening his life, he forged ahead with the work God had called him to do. Paul came to the city of Thessalonica on his second missionary journey around AD 50. He began immediately to debate with the Jews in the city out of the scriptures with reference to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Luke says Paul spent three Sabbath days in Thessalonica teaching and preaching, but there were those in the city who grew jealous about Paul's ministry. So they incited a riot against him and his companions. So much trouble did his opponents raise that Paul had to be smuggled out of Thessalonica to the city of Berea. After a while, Paul was so eager to know how the work was going in Thessalonica that he sent Timothy back to that city to get a report on the Christian witness he had planted there. There was good news from Timothy. The affection of the Thessalonians for Paul was strong and secure. Many of them continued to stand fast in their faith. The news about his work in Thessalonica brought great joy to Paul. But as is the case in so many of our churches and so much of our work, the news was not all good coming out of Thessalonica. Paul had been so effective in his preaching about the second coming of the Lord that some people had stopped working and had abandoned all ordinary pursuits, awaiting the second coming with a kind of hysterical 
expectancy. Some in the city, misunderstanding their new freedom in Christ Jesus, were despising lawful authority. Others were in danger of relapsing into immorality. And of course, there were some in the church unhappy with Paul's leadership, so they continued to badmouth him, falsely claiming that Paul preached the gospel for what he could get out of it. It does not matter how sincere you are. There will always be those who question your motives for the work that you do on behalf of Jesus Christ. We can understand Paul giving thanks to God for the things that had gone well in Thessalonica. But Paul said, in all things, give thanks. He is also saying that he gives thanks to God for the things that were not going well in Thessalonica. People quitting their jobs, refusing to work because they misunderstood his teachings on the second coming of Christ. Christians refusing to obey the laws of the land because they misunderstood their new freedom in Christ Jesus. People backsliding in the congregation, going back to acting like they acted before they accepted Christ. And of course, hell raises in the church grumbling about Paul's leadership. Is he saying give thanks for that kind of stuff also? Really? Just like there were problems in Paul's day and he urged the Christians to give thanks, so too with the problems in our day. We are urged to give thanks in all things. We find ourselves living through a season of uncertainty, turmoil, and despair. Countries throughout the world are being visited by the grim reaper. It seems as if biblical prophecy, in a manner of speaking, is being fulfilled in our day in a very menacing way. We live in a time of war and rumors of war. Nations rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There are famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. According to Jesus in Matthew 24, these are but the beginning of sorrows. In our day, even to this very hour, the world is beset by a pandemic of humongous proportion. To date, 102 million people are infected by COVID-19 throughout the world. And over 2.2 million are dead. The United States that leads the world in infections at the time of this recording, over 26 million Americans are infected. And some 443,000 are dead. We have a vaccine now to protect us from the virus, and we have a government trying to get the vaccine to millions of people who need and want it. We are hoping and praying that the government can quickly get this pandemic under control. More and more Americans are experiencing food insecurity and thousands line up each day for food in America. In America, suicides are up even among our young people. Many have given up hope that a better day is possible. Domestic violence is on the rise. Police stations across the country report an increase in domestic abuse phone calls where families are struggling to live in close quarters with one another each and every day. We, one and all, are living through a very difficult time 
in life. In the scriptures before us, we find some hope, some words of comfort and succor for those who are struggling to make it another day. In the midst of all that we are experiencing, the Apostle Paul speaks to the people of his day and also to ours with these words, in all things, give thanks. And actually we find a trio of admonitions in verses 16 through 18. Always rejoice, pray without ceasing, and in all things, give thanks. The admonition that claims our attention today is the third one. In all things, give thanks. Paul is not here simply handing out helpful hints for hurtful habits. Rather, he is here modeling behavior. He is not asking of us what he has not tried to live in his own life. Listen to him as he recounts his own sufferings in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 25. Listen to Paul. Five times I have received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. For a night and a day, I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers and sisters, in hardship through many a sleepless night, hungry and thirsty, often without food, cold and naked, and besides other things, I am under daily pressure because of my anxiety for all the churches. Listen to the apostle. And yet he says, in all things, give thanks. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in all things, give thanks. Most of us would want to adjust Paul's words and qualify his blanket exhortation. Any number of us, myself included, would have preferred for Paul to say, in some situations, give thanks. In some circumstances, give thanks. In some things, give thanks. Such qualifications would be more suitable to our taste and to our own set of realities. And I can hear some of you saying, Paul does not know what I am going through. He does not know how tough this year has been for so many of us. In spite of all we have been through, Paul's words stand before us today in holy writ, unedited and unaltered. In all things, give thanks. So I ask again, how can we possibly give thanks in all things when we remember how tough life can be at times? First of all, we must remember that we are not required to bear the burdens of life alone. We can give thanks in all things when we remember that we have God to help us. Paul reminds us in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to those who are the called according to his purpose. In this life, there are terrible things that happen to us, unfortunate things, unfair things, unbelievable things, sad and terrible things, irreversible and unchangeable things, things that hurt us and terribly disappoint us, things from which we never fully recover, things that make us different people for the rest of our lives, things so horrible and hideous that we will carry their memory to our grave. 
But we must always remember that God is at work in and through those things to bring about good. Second, I would like to remind us that we can give thanks in all things, no matter what befalls us, when we seek to please and honor God and do his will. We give thanks when we know that no matter what confronts us in life, we will do our best to please God in all situations. In time, in a time of great need and great sorrow, Christians ought to ask themselves, did we do our best? to help those who were hurting? Did we do our best as agents of God's redemptive purposes on earth to make this world a better world? In spite of what we were going through, did we look around to help others who were hurting more than we are? Third, we can give thanks in everything when we remember that God is there also. On another occasion, Paul and Silas were thrown into prison in Philippi with their feet fastened in the stocks. What did they do? They sang hymns. They praised God, for they recognized that God was with them in their suffering. God has promised never to leave us, never to leave us alone. Fourth, we can give thanks in everything when we remember that there is no circumstance God cannot use for his purposes. We are told in the book of James to count it all joy when we fall into different kinds of temptations. Why? Because God is the only one I know who can step into a bad situation and bring good out of it somehow. In remarkable ways, even what is truly bad to us become something that God can use for his glory and for his honor. Fifth, we can give thanks in everything when we remember that God's wisdom is greater than ours. In our church, in the black church in which I grew up in Texas, we used to sing a song that said in part, we cannot see in the future. We cannot see through dark trials but walk on by faith each day. On Monday, walk on. On Tuesday, walk on. Let Jesus be your guide. He's able to carry the load, for he can see way down the road. Walk on by faith each day. Finally, and this is a true story, there is always something for which to give thanks. Even on the darkest day, there are blessings to count. The wife of a Texas pastor was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and near the end of her life, she no longer recognized her husband of 50 years of marriage. He looked after her 24 seven and kept her at home to look after her himself. One night, as they prepared for bed, she asked him to leave the room because she no longer recognized who he was. She said, who are you? I don't know you. He said, I'm your husband of 50 years. She said, I don't know you. And she asked him to leave. And so as not to upset her anymore, he decided to walk down the hall to the spare bedroom. And as he walked down the hall, he could hear his wife suffering from Alzheimer's disease. He could hear his wife praying, saying, Lord Jesus, I thank you tonight for protecting me from that man. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you did not let that man hurt me. And when the pastor got to the spare bedroom, he fell down on his knees and he said, Lord Jesus, I want to thank you tonight for even though my wife has forgotten me, she has not forgotten you in all things, in all things. 
give thanks. And the people of God said, Amen. Please join me now in a covenant prayer of recommitment to justice. O God, who has created your children to be free, we attest in word and deed that you are our God and we are your people. From our earliest days, as the people whom you intend to be free, O God, you have called us forth from self-seeking bondage, comfort, complacency, and complaint to freeing and redeeming action for justice everywhere in the world. You are our freeing God, and we would be your free and freeing people. O God of Exodus and the burning bush, of the prophets and of Jesus, we hear your powerful calling to be your servants in the service of all those who are oppressed. At every turn, we hear your voice in the cries of the poor, the hungry, the imprisoned, and the broken. For you have made yourself one with those who seek justice, freedom, and peace. We share a vision, a promise, and a yearning for the day of your reign, O God. You are our servant, God and we would be your serving people. O God, our sustainer, search our hearts and reveal to us our sinfulness. All the ways that we contribute to injustice and to self-destroying bondage. Give us deep courage to find the true path of your way, ready to give our very selves as living sacrifices for your will. We heard your calling. Hear us now as we make our pledge. All rise if able. You are our God. God. And, and we, we are, are your people. people. We, we pledge ourselves now to pursue relentlessly that, that living, breathing justice which, which transforms persons and peoples. To your will for justice, we commit ourselves and pledge ourselves, our funds, our actions. Through Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm Pastor Jessica, the interim pastor at Forked River Presbyterian Church down on the Jersey Shore. And I wanted to introduce you to our Hunger Action Team ministry. This is one of the most vibrant ministries in our congregation and certainly one of the ones that didn't skip a beat in 2020. They knew that people were hungry and that the way that things were going with quarantine just made that even more true. This is a big part of the heart of this congregation and is a ministry I'm so glad I've had the chance to work with in the time I've been their pastor. Uh, Isabel Orris, who is the moderator of Mission and also of the HAT ministry, is gonna tell you a bit more. I am Isabel Loris. Yeah, I am the chairperson of HAT, um, which is run through the mission committee of that church. HAT supplies fresh produce to the Lacey Food Bank on a monthly basis, um, in addition to supporting financially other endeavors that are going on within our community that has to do with food and hunger. Um, how many people are involved in the, that work with the Lacey Food Bank and the free meal program that you guys participate right. in? Right. Um, our, our committee is basically about 10 people. It goes up and down, but in addition to which our committee, the whole congregation is part of it because they, they support us financially and with any program we have going on there, they do support us and we couldn't do it without them. 
members of my committee and see how caring and wonderful they are. And, um, and secondly, um, to know that through our efforts, we are giving food, fresh produce, which many of the food banks do not give out. We supply that to the people and, um, and that's important. Because I believe we have to look beyond ourselves, beyond the walls of our church, and reach out to the people in need. And um, I think we are filling that need to a very small degree, but we are filling it. And that's important to me. I think it's important to help, to interact with the community, and to be there for them when they need us. Siblings in faith, go from the holy ground you are on, giving thanks in all things to reap the harvest of God's love. Go from the holy ground you are on to continue to sow seeds of justice and peace and God's mercy. Go from the holy ground you are on to nourish and be nourished, knowing that God is ever a part of our lives, our service, and our journey. And now may our creator, savior, and sustaining God keep you and bless you and go with you in peace. Amen and amen. <laughs>